Thanks. So I've got some stuff that I wanted to throw out to you. In my imagination, this room would have been a lot smaller, and you guys would be a lot closer, because I think like the first guy that's sitting right over there is going to get everything I brought for you. Um, actually, it, it's yeah, you're probably going to get all of them. But I didn't just bring you like little silly hats. Actually, what I brought you is this magazine that we just put out this week from KPN. It's the European Cybersecurity Perspectives Report, which we, we write. We publish it from KPN CERT. And it's just fun, but the fun part about it is there are stickers. And like every quality magazine, it has a centerfold. All right, guy in hoodie, but still, you get the idea. You can also download it online and stuff. It's just, it's just something we do for fun every year. But if you want some stickers and the centerfold, um, I'll, I'll be throwing out the hats. It's your proof of purchase for the other stuff. But you've got to complete um, questions. So, you know, the reason that you're here listening to me talk about quantum and quantum mechanics and post-quantum computing and cryptography is because actually of my obligation, our mission at KPN is to protect customers. And it's to keep KPN reliable, secure, safe, trusted for customers, partners, and society because we're the incumbent operator. We're part of the national digital critical infrastructure of the Netherlands. And one of the things you've got to ask yourself is, how long do you want your communications, your data, your bank account records, any biometric data, those, you know, dating pictures and the early days of dating of you naked in a hot tub somewhere that you've submitted, encrypted, of course. How long, how long do you want those to stay secret? Give me a number. How long do you want your naked dick pics to stay secret? <laughs> no, dude, let's be open. We're among friends. Give me a number. One day? One day? Seriously? Do okay. That's the guy to party with tonight. All right. How long would you like your secrets to be secret? Infinite? I like her. But, you know, are, do you drink? Okay, no, I'm just kidding. So, but, but you get the idea. So we have a, a relatively like, different set of tolerances for our data, but I think in general, when we're not joking about stuff like this, we actually do have a, have a low tolerance for very specific types of data for us to become public domain. And I think what I want to talk to you about here is I want us to understand those considerations, to understand what the problem is, and then to understand what it is that we're going to do about them. You know, like, let's take a look at how we're actually going to address it, and then we can figure out a game plan going forward. So let's talk about what the threat is. Who works for an intel agency? Go ahead. Anybody? No? All right. Well, the, the clue is that intel agencies, for a very long time, pretty much have complete information awareness. They know everything there is to know about us. They can build a digital life dossier about us pretty much at any time. They know what we say, they know where we are, they know who we hang out with, they've got everything. And even though in the early 90s, and this is an age test, how many of people remember the original crypto wars? There's not that many old people here. Okay, all right. Uh, but the idea was we actually won the original crypto wars, and that was when, for those of you that don't know, it became illegal to uh, give good crypto outside of national borders. And if you wanted to give good crypto outside of national borders, you had to apply for an export license for that good crypto. It was one of the reasons that Phil Zimmerman, like, you know, suffered from the NSA, basically, because when he tried to distribute PGP, he got in lots of trouble because he didn't have one of those export licenses. So, what we also see is that except, you know, for a couple of really funny videos about dick pics, we're not massively enraged about the fact that the government has this ability. How many of you are outraged that they have this complete surveillance power? But, you know, not everybody's hand is going up. And that's the problem. We're not all outraged. And that's why we have a renewal of these crypto wars. What we saw with Snowden is that he didn't just tell us about the, the magnitude of the problem, but he also made it very specific. There were two specific sets of documents that he had put out. One of them is called Penetrating Hard Targets, where he talked specifically about you know, how uh, they were going after things that were protected through strong encryption and actually targeting traffic that was protected like that. And the other one was called Owning the Net, which actually talked about you know, other ways to get to uh, 
uh, quantum in a different way. And they were talking about, you know, developing a small scale quantum machine using the black budget of the NSA where they don't have to disclose all of their methods and tactics. And, you know, I'd never thought I'd say this ever, like really ever, but I, do you guys know who this guy is now? <laughs> Who's that? I miss him. Don't you miss James Comey? My James Comey was fighting for backdoors on encryption. And I never thought I would have to miss James Comey. But I do miss James Comey because like, he wasn't unique in this area of wanting backdoors. What actually, it started with the original Crypto Wars guy was a guy named Louis Free. He liked himself and he wrote a book called Bringing Down the Mafia, Investigating Bill Clinton. This is about the blue dress with the stain on it. <laughs> and uh, fighting the war on terror. Okay, so that was his, his great achievements. And um, what I think we need to realize is that this is not dead, even though Free lost his original battle, except with Bill Clinton, even though he lost that one, Comey was actually you know, really trying very hard, and he was saying this is really part of our rights as law enforcement in order to be able to do this. So the whole iPhone debacle, if you guys remember, the San Bernardino case and everything, and what they finally did with Cellbrite to buy, okay, I don't need to tell you that story, I see a lot of nods. But Theresa May in the UK, and also in France, are still wanting these encryption backdoors. We still need to be worried about the sanctity of our current cryptography, yeah? Because the idea is that this complete universal surveillance has only one problem, the going dark problem. It's those small areas where the eye of Sauron cannot penetrate because there is that good viable crypto without any back doors being used. Yeah? The other clue is there, there's a little bit of weird, fuzzy, narcissistic thinking around this. They think if we have this stuff, if we build these back doors, front doors, you know, side doors, whatever, they want to have a split key management, which means that you would have a different key for different judicial entities, but think about how worse it could be. For commonly used products that have crypto built in, you would have to have different keys based on geography. Think about what I'm saying. So to get to commonly used products, you would have a build where you would have a split key for China, with all of its necessary repercussions, and you'd have a split key for the US, and you'd have it different based on geography. And of course, the government is the person to trust when you require flawless technical execution and perfect process management. We all know that the government excels in those things, right? So this is a real issue. That ha it requires a lot of magical thinking because it means that they, are they believe that they can actually guarantee the sanctity of a system that's supposed to be so strong that the only person who has this golden key is themselves and that no one else could possibly ever break into it. So it's flawed by its very origin. So now you've got to get to, all right, so why what does quantum have to do with this? Well, let's go back a little bit. When we talk about classical physics, we're talking about, you know, stuff before 1900. You know, the guy who sat underneath the tree and had that apple fall on his head. Classical physics, right? Uh, we're talking about things that we kind of understand because we talk about stuff that we can observe in the macroscopic world. It's big. We get it. It's very deterministic. I do this thing, and then this thing happens. It's really intuitive. We, we really like kind of say, oh, I, I get that somehow. It all makes sense. When it comes to quantum physics, though, and quantum mechanics, it's after 1900. It pretty much, like wh when you talk to physicists, it began after the 1920 Solvay Convention, where Albert Einstein hung out with Bohr, and they both got into really big fights and uh, discussions about is it or isn't it really there, and you know, does God play dice or not, is this possibility for something to be so probabilistic that you can't actually predict the outcome, but only the probability of a potential outcome happening. The biggest thing with quantum is that there's a very strong central role of the observer and it's actually not very intuitive. So you're watching something happen that you can't actually figure it out. And it all happens on such a small scale that it actually to observe these reactions, you not only need an electron microscope, you need to cool things down to a couple of degrees below Kelvin in order to actually see the interactions happening and taking place. So what are the properties when we talk about a quantum computer? Well, a regular computer, a regular computer. We all know what a regular computer is. It's got a zero and a one. It's binary. We all understand that, right? But a quantum computer, and this already blows my mind, it can be a zero and a one at the same time. So think about this. In the place 
yeah, where you would have only one spot to occupy, a zero or a one, you now have the potential of having both. When you have something called entanglement, which is you take one qubit, which is a zero or a one, and you entangle it with another qubit that is a zero or a one, you now have in the same spot where you would have a zero or a one, a zero and a one, a zero and a one, and a zero and a one. As depending on the amount of qubits that you're entangling, you've exponentially increased the scale of computing that you have in the same spot. Yeah? Are we all clear? Anybody have any? Yeah, no, we're not all clear? Okay. But it's this, this scale principle is the thing that makes quantum computers so unbelievably cool and able to do things so much faster than our classical computers. One of the things that we were struggling with was this principle of entanglement. Because Einstein never really liked entanglement. He called it spooky action at a distance. You know, he couldn't really believe this principle that two particles that were separated, that when put together would cancel each other out, could actually be uh, having a relationship with each other such that when you affect the one, you would affect the other. And the distance didn't matter. Yeah? So they, we find this really, really difficult, and Einstein found this really difficult, and he said, no, 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 you know what? It's not possible. So one of the fundamental dilemmas with Bohr. So the way to test this was always called the Bell test. And Bell test had these loopholes built in so that scientists could kind of figure out, okay, well, this is what I observed, this is what's happening, but I've got to build in these loopholes because otherwise my experiment won't work. And the first ever loophole-free Bell test actually happened in the Netherlands only about a year and a half ago. So at the TU University of Delft, they basically put two diamond particles where they were, uh, that were actually entangled. So they're using the, the diamonds, sending photons between the two areas. They were separated by a distance of four kilometers. And they put these two things at such a distance, at this four kilometers, where when they changed and permuted one particle on one end of the diamond, the other side changed as well. Imagine not four kilometers, but imagine the distance of the universe. Because this is the kind of thinking that's required when you're talking about quantum mechanics. It's taking something at this scale and projecting it on a much larger scale, and you realize how cool it is. But the clue is, quantum is finicky. It's finicky because it's very, very, very fragile. When something is existing in a quantum state, it can be really easily disturbed. It can be disturbed because like, when you're actually trying to examine it, you have like a, a basic amount of you know, coherence that gets lost and actually can break this quantum state. When it comes to computing, trying to copy or eavesdrop the communication that's happening on a quantum scale is not possible because the observer actually screws up the communication. So there are certain principles like fragility and non-cloning which are inherent to quantum which make like for digital information that we can't just say, ah, oh, I see Alice and Bob talking, let me just take that away over here, which is what an intelligence agency would like to do. We should also know is it, talking about finicky, there's more than one type of quantum computer. So before we get all confused, you know, you, you guys have heard about D-Wave maybe when you've heard of quantum? So D-Wave is not a universal quantum computer, which is the thing that I'm a bit worried about. It's actually a quantum annealer. So it's working and building based on a different principle of, of building the qubits and allowing them to grow. And the quantum annealer from D-Wave already has a couple of thousand qubits. In fact, it should be getting somewhere like in the next month up to 2,500 qubits. That's a pretty big machine for a quantum annealer. Um, and the analog quantum uh, machine is probably the thing that we're going to see the most of in like the mid-range, if you will, that's coming up in the next years. But what everybody's working on, the holy grail of quantum computers is the universal quantum computer. So Microsoft, Google, everybody's in on this. And what it really means is, if we bring that all back together, with regular processing power of our classical computers, we hit a sort of ceiling. So we had, you know, processors, we kept adding more and more and more, and we had this idea that if we distributed our computing power, it would mean that the more processors and the more systems we had, we would keep increasing linearly in the amount of computing power. You know, Moore's Law, everybody knows Moore's Law, but Moore's Law at a certain point hits Amdahl's Law. And what Amdahl's Law says is you can keep adding more processors, but actually your computing power is actually going to start decreasing and ebbing away, and it won't have that same linear growth. 
So the idea is our processing power, regardless of the, of the security stuff that's associated with this problem, regardless, is coming to a sort of semi-ceiling. We need to do something else in order to process the types of data that we would need to do in order to like look at uh, proteinoids and their function or to simulate scientific experiments. We need something else. We actually really need the quantum computer. The quantum computer, though, is such a holy grail for scientists for so long that we already have algorithms that would work on a quantum computer that were designed for it before it was ever built and available. The first algorithm, which has a huge repercussion for our industry, is Shor's algorithm. And what Shor's algorithm allows us to do is integer factorization. Now we're going to get to the hats. OK, um, who can tell me what uh, 9 times 8 is? Come on, guys. Seriously. Dudes. There's an engineer here somewhere, right? All right. Oh, throw it to the guy behind you. Thank you. Nine times eight. You're on. 72. I just want to make sure he really knew it. All right. <laughs> now tell me the factors of 72. Tell me all the numbers you have that can add up to, that can multiply out to 72. Dude, you got a hat. All right, who can tell me all the factors of 72? All right, the guy all the way in the back, who I'm not going to get to, but we're going to pass it on to him. Like, we're gonna, Oh, sorry. No one was harmed in the throwing of the hat. Uh, guy in the back all the way in the row. Yeah, you, you have time now. But you see my point? You see my point, right? It's easier to multiply two numbers to get to 72 than to figure out what all the factors were of 72, right? This is called a one-way function in mathematics. This is the basis of where we do cryptography. Actually, cryptography, when we do it as a community, is based on two hard math problems. The first is integer factorization to figure out what all the factors are of 72. The other problem is the discrete logarithm problem. So if we take a number and we put it to a ex particular exponent, then we have a result, right? We know what those things are. So if I say, you know, uh, uh, 4 to the power of 3, it's OK. <laughs> who, who said that? You did. Here you go. So you guys all get a book. That's the whole point of the hat. It's like I can throw them, and throwing books, I might really take out an eye. Um, so, th so the clue is very good. So the idea is that it, w if we can do that, but now if I give you that same number, and I expect you to come back to the exponent that was used, it's a little harder. So. Our cryptography results in using those two hard math problems, putting them in an algorithm, adding a couple of salts, and doing a couple of iterations, and there we go. That's our basis for our modern asymmetric cryptography. That's public key. So um, we've got two algorithms to do things on a quantum computer. One, one of them is integer factorization. So we can actually do that really, really quickly. Yeah, so now we base our current crypto on you can still do some of this stuff with a classical computer or a classical computing platforms. However, it'll take the lifetime of the universe to do it. That's what we base our current crypto on now. With a quantum computer, it'll take a couple of seconds because we'll use Shor's algorithm to do the integer factorization, and then we'll use Grover's to go through the database and start ratcheting and searching to optimize search through the database. Yeah, it's just going to stuff values until it gets the right value to get to your clean ciphertext. OK, so there's a lot of other cool stuff that you can do with a quantum computer. So I'm not urging to throw the baby out with the bathwater to say this is going to break our crypto. But it should be clear that everybody is trying to build a quantum computer and figure out new ways to use it in order to uh, both defeat and supplement our security issues. What you should know is that. You know, when I say globally, we talk about D-Wave, but Google actually has two machines. They have the D-Wave machine, and they're building their own trapped ion machine to have a quantum computer. You also have universities and academic institutions that are working on 16-qubit systems in Europe and 20-qubit systems uh, like in California. And we have IBM, which has released the first ever public cloud platform where you can play, you can all get an account now on IBM's quantum computer. It's available. Just know that all the IPR belongs to IBM. If you're cool with that, then you can go ahead and play. So we're not there yet. 
you know, we're not there yet. We're not there yet in terms of having a quantum computer. We're not there yet in terms of breaking the algorithms that we currently have. You should just know that it will be a lot easier. It'll be done in seconds, in minutes, rather than in eons. And what we should be doing about it is a three-step plan. How many of you have seen the NSA Suite B advice on quantum computing? Okay, that's one guy. Homework, two guys. Okay, so do me a favor, just Google NSA Suite B and look at the advice that they have for their own community of people who are supplying things to them for how to transition to post-quantum algorithms. Yeah, and what they want to do with their current existing set of algorithms, because we can all do this. What they're advising us to do is say, every single algorithm you already use now, your current public key crypto, so if you use AES, for example, use 256-bit AES. So everything you have, just increase your key length. That's a good starting point for what we have now. Because before you have a quantum computer with enough qubits for it to launch a viable attack, it's going to take a little while. You're just buying time by doing the first measure. After you do that, there are, in certain places, applicability to use quantum key distribution. And then the third thing that I want to ask you to do is look at post-quantum cryptographic algorithms. But let's talk about that for a minute. So here's the NSA um, advice, because as you know, NSA has two big parts, right? You have the SIGINT part, which is doing a large-scale data collections and signals intelligence, but you also have the Information Assurance Directive, which is there to protect national secrets and critical infrastructure. Um, and it's the NSA uh, advice to say, look, we're going to transition. We want all of you to transition, so let's get started. And they're only looking at their own community, but this should be wider scale. What you should also know is that everybody is looking at this advice and following it also from the intelligence agencies across the world. How does quantum key distribution work? The clue is that, you know, like the first one, these algorithms that we currently have are internet scale. We have them everywhere, we've deployed them universally, they're highly fault tolerant, they're very stable, they're very diverse, we can use that. The problem with QKD is it's not that diverse yet. You can't use it under all these hostile conditions. It's much more temperamental and finicky, but it's still an option between very specific places in your network. So let's talk about how it works. If Alice wants to talk to Bob and they're using a quantum channel, which is basically a single bit of fiber with a single photon emitter between those two points, transmitting a set of information which will be like assessing the, the validity of the link as well as like the cleanliness in order to actually transmit keys. If Eve is on that link, what should happen? Because of fragility and no cloning. Do I have a hat left? No, I don't have a hat left. It gets disturbed. All right. So let's, do, yeah, you guys can share the hat. I don't know how you're going to do that. Yeah, okay, there you go. So here's like how it really works. So you've got Alice talking to Bob, and what uh, Alice has is a set of polarizers. It's just, you know, think about polarized lenses. But she has a set of polarizers in which the photon source is going to go through. So the photon source, which is like pointing in every which direction, is actually going to be push through the polarizers and then come out the other way with a particular orientation. Depending on how she set this up, Bob will need to set up his polarizers the same way in order to receive the photons from Alice. If Eve is hanging out between Alice and Bob, she's going to change the information. And it's not going to be the same thing that Alice has sent that Bob receives. It's going to be gibberish. It's pretty funky, no? So it's a very simple idea, but it's using this principle that just by observing it, you're disrupting the communications, and then you know at least when you have a clean link. But think about the constraints here. You need the single photon emitter. You're not going to do that internet scale, right? Or are you? You need to have this uh, fiber. And fiber has distance limitations. Anybody know what the distance limitations are of fiber without any repeaters in between? No, it's a bit longer. Even without repeaters, you know, just a single piece of dark fiber, if you want to put the two photon emitters, it's roughly, they have a test about 64 kilometers. So you can do 64 kilometers, no stuff in between, clean, you know, initial dark fiber, you can put some light into it, and you're good to go for 64. But think about how many points you want to communicate at that are greater than 64 kilometers. You've got a problem, right? Guys? Yeah? Okay. 
So then, um, then you have this thing, which I think is really funky, called free space quantum key distribution. And the idea is if you take it away from the fiber limitations, you can actually transmit over free space, which means you can take uh, the same principles of shining light, basically, between these two sources, but you can actually pull it through. This is a real project that happened. Um, uh, what's his face? Um, Paolo Villarese. That's his face. So Google Paolo Villarese because the Italians did it. They basically hung out in the Canary Islands between Las Palmas and Tenerife, distance of 144 kilometers. They had an observer, and then they had a separate classical internet connection between the two, and they basically did the same exact thing that we just looked at on the previous slide, but then over free space. So now I want to talk to you about what the Chinese are doing. Because the Chinese actually believe, you know what I said, finicky, short distances, blah, blah, blah? Forget that. Because what the Chinese are doing is they know something we don't know. What they're trying to do, because there is no quantum repeater yet, in order to extend that naturally, the distance between 64 kilometers, they are building a 2,000 kilometer long network if that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will. A 2,000 long kilometer network that is based on quantum key distribution. And the Chinese are the first in the world that have publicly launched a satellite in low Earth orbit that allows for free space quantum communication from the satellite to this network. So here's the deal. They say that this is there for a regional war. That's why they're doing this. But dude, if they're doing this for a regional war, how come that thing's got a satellite? So pretty much, we can read everybody's communications except the Chinese. Okay. So the third thing, the third thing uh, that you should know is that last bit is the most promising bit. So the first thing I told you to do was increase the key length of your current cryptographic algorithms, right? The second thing I told you to do is look for specific points in your network, because you're not going to do free space anytime soon unless you have a tank, and you've got the budget, and you've got to put a photon emitter, and you're pulling it up to space. You've got your own satellite somewhere. If you have your own satellite somewhere, please come talk to me. Um, but if you're doing that, then you've got free space going for you. Or if you have two large observatories where you can actually have line of sight, you've got free space going for you. But otherwise, you don't. And there's all this kind of atmospheric disturbances, finicky circumstances, not fun. But what's really, really viable is to just replace the algorithms we're using now and make them quantum resistant. So even with a post-quantum Computer, uh, post quantum computer, even with a quantum computer, you still have algorithms that are post quantum viable. Clear? Okay, actually, it's not so clear for me because there, there, are, there is no fully viable candidate yet. In 1978, uh, they had an initial algor algorithm called Mechalese, and I'm trying to remember the university where it came from because it's somewhere in the United States and my brain is fogging, but in um, 1978 we had Macaulay's. But Macaulay's is slow. And you know, our current cryptographic algorithms, when we want to use them, the only thing that kind of bars their use in all circumstances at all times when you look at telecom infrastructure and everything else is computing power and bandwidth. Yeah? So Macaulay's is a killer for computing power and bandwidth. You want it to work on your smartphone. You want it to work in all circumstances. You want it to work in really low bandwidth connections where you, know, you don't have this stuff. You still want it to work. So we need to find new algorithms that'll be able to do what our current algorithms can under those tight conditions and then still be viable against attacks from a quantum computer. So the kinds of stuff that we're looking at now is super singular isogeny Diffie-Hellman. I dare you to say that three times fast. And we're looking at uh, a new hope, which is actually an algorithm, a Canada algorithm brought out by Microsoft. Microsoft also has a huge uh, quantum computing lab and are working on post-quantum computing as well, uh, and, and algorithms. And like the people who are really like in Europe, uh, the major folks for post-quantum is Dan Bernstein and Tanya Lange. They wrote a book and everything, and they host uh, PQ Crypto, Org, and they have a conference, and they're really, really doing amazing work from the University of Eindhoven. One thing that I need you to consider, though, is that we don't have this yet. I want you to think about your organization and the institutions that you belong to, and I want you to think about how long it's going to take them to transition to a new set of algorithms. Because right now, 
we're still communicating with them. And the NSA still has that Utah data center collecting everything we communicate. And my theory is that it's capture now and decrypt later. And you need to think the information that you're transmitting now with old cheap ass algorithms, that's not true by the way, I still love AES, but if you're still using old algorithms to, to encrypt your information and it's being collected by the NSA and by the time they have something viable enough to crack it, how valuable is that information going forward? Look, your WhatsApp conversations with your girlfriend, not so much. But maybe your tax information, maybe your medical information, because if you're planning on being alive for longer than 10 years, you may have a problem. Capture now, decrypt later. Everything we transmit now is already vulnerable. We are going to need more time to fully transition over. We need, as a security community, to be informed of the problem in order to be able to act on it. So one of the first things that we did is take a couple of toe dips on the water. Um, I joined the EU High-Level Steering Committee. I didn't join because you can't join, but I, I'm part of the EU High-Level Steering Committee on um, quantum. So there's a flagship of one billion euros from the EU. How often does the EU give anyone a billion euros? Well, they gave it for this quantum flagship project. So, and the High-Level Steering Committee is determining the pillars of how we're ha having future developments on quantum and what we're going to do with that money. Woo. Um, and we're really exploring how to look at all sides of that problem. So that's the one billion dollars. And euro, sorry, euros, euro. Um, you're throwing me off, dude, with those numbers. It's like a continuous, you've got five minutes left. But um, so the idea is that we're just getting our toes dipped in the water. You know, we, we are aware of all the developments of both computing and on the algorithmic side. Uh, one of the first things that we did was we set up a, a QKD link between two data centers in the Netherlands that were really important to us because it's not there for everywhere in your network, but you can do it on very specific points. So we wanted to know how hard is it? How hard is it to do this key exchange and then transmit all the data over this fiber? And so we did that experiment last year in May. We are, I'm part of the board of PQ Crypto, Tanya and Dan, to be on their advisory board to really like be right there when they're ready to have new algorithm sets and then be able to test them on our entire network. So from our mobile devices all the way up into our uh, core network. So really, in conclusion, we're just getting started. You know, and the biggest reason I'm here to you today is to encourage you to get started. Because if we don't get started now, you know, we're never going to be ready in time because they're not going to announce to all of us that they have a, they being whoever, have a quantum computer that's viable and available and ready to break, break all your crypto. If you think back, you know, how many of you saw the, that movie um, about um, thingy? Um, which one? Oh, I thought he, had, he was going to win another hat. No, it's about uh, Enigma. What was that movie, guys, with the mathematician? Al Turing, yeah. What was the name of it, though? The Imitation Game, thank you. Wish I had a hat. Um, but The Imitation Game uh, was an awesome film because it showed us that even after like, you had possession of Enigma, they were still, the UK government was still handing out Enigma to the Allies and saying, this is a really good encryption thingy, why don't you use it? After they could break the code so they could possess their strategic advantage as long as possible. It's going to be the same thing with quantum computing. All countries who have this will try to keep it as long as possible. And that means that we need to get prepared now. There's a NIST uh, standardization set up for a new set of algorithms. You know, we can all participate and we can all like help be part of this effort. I encourage you to get started. So in the coming like weeks, days, months, if you do nothing else, just Google some of the stuff that I said to you. Just, you know, subscribe to some of the, the Twitter accounts of the people who are working on it. The EU flagship also has its own account. Just be aware of it. And the one last thing is, don't do only one thing. We shouldn't change our modus operandi because of a new threat. We in the security community have always been doing defense in depth, as long as we've ever had it, you know, as long as we've been doing defense. This is the same thing. Just having a post-quantum algorithm is not enough. Just increasing your key length is not enough. Just doing QKD is not enough. You need to combine these tactics for maximal efficiency. Thank you so much.
you have any questions? Yeah. If anybody. Um, you mentioned um, briefly quantum computing for uh, those two specific algorithms that break integer factorization and the other one, the um, exponent factorization. Uh, why is quantum computing so much faster? Like, what, what about quantum computing itself makes it faster? Well, it's actually, more efficient? so it's what we talked about. So the, the idea is that the two things that are really making it faster is the presence of the qubits and the way that the information is going to be stored and processed. You know, the, to be fair, like this is what we think is going to happen when you have this amount of qubits. It's a projection based on what we think is going to be the inherent additional computing capability with a quantum computer. But the clue is, right now, remember the finicky stuff that I told you about? Uh, the problem with coherence means that if we have like 10 qubits, we need to have almost a supercomputer next to it, error correcting all the faults. So the fault tolerant, error free qubit thing is a little bit of a holy grail. Google had, has announced, for example, that they're going to have a 50 qubit fault tolerant um, a uh, quantum supremacy experiment, because when they have 50 qubits, it will be superior to any classical computing algorithm we have because of the amount of computing power available, like forget Cray, or I think the fastest supercomputer now is in China somewhere. Forget all of that. If we have 50 qubits, it'll be bigger, better, and better than that. Um, and it's really about the presence of those qubits and the ability to process information exponentially uh, more than, than just a quadratic increase. That's it. Was that yeah. clear? Do you, did you get your question answered? You're like, what the fuck is she talking about? <laughs> All right. Yeah, oh. Thanks. Um, I, I read that D-Wave says that they are uh, offering a 2,000 qubit computer. Uh, where's the marketing catch? No, there's no marketing catch. They really are. That's, that's what they say because they have, but they have a different type of quantum computer, so you can't run Shores and Grovers on the D-Wave quantum computer. So you're going to be able to run those algorithms on a universal quantum computer, but on the quantum annealer, not so much. So it's doing different things. So there are different types of topologies for a quantum computer, and the one that we're interested in is the universal. So all qubits are not created equal, depending on how they're being built. That's, yeah. How much does one qubit take in terms of size? Ah, you mean like actual... Actual data size. Actual data size. I don't know. Because if it can occupy both. Then well, I actually haven't considered it because it's a subatomic particle. I haven't considered its data size yet. What? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh. How much does one qubit take up in space? Yeah, I, I actually, guys, I really, I don't know how much one qubit takes up in space. I don't know. It's a good Just Google making question. me walk loads. Yeah. Okay. Uh, outside of the realm of crypto and information security, what sort of impact do you see this technology having in the world? Really good things. So, for example, um, look. I, really good things. So I don't want us to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So I, I, I do this thing. I, have you guys ever heard of Singularity University? Oh, that's not so good. Well, it's this thing between Google and NASA, and I'm on the faculty. And, um, and the clue is that um, there's a lot of really smart people that, that go there. And uh, at, there's this really cool professor who figured out, well, Chemotherapy, you know, cancer treatment, it only actually has a positive effect on 2% of patients. 2%, I had no idea. I had no idea that chemotherapy only works at a total amount of 2% of patients. And the reason that it only works is because we actually don't know how to prescribe the right drugs for the right tumors, because we don't know how the organism as a total is going to work. So what he figured out was, okay, so what if I could take some stem cells, sequence the DNA of the tumor, and of the patient, obviously, the, the tumor on the patient, and then uh, figure out uh, how to grow an organ on a chip. He's actually doing this. This is a real company actually really doing this. So then I have enough biomass to be able to test cancer treatments 
on that tumor actually using that patient's DNA. So really customized medicine. But uh, this amino acid understanding and understanding its behavior, the amount of information that was required to be processed is not something that's capable of, it's called proteinoids, and it's not capable uh, of being handled by a classical computer. It's just too many data sets, too large, too complex, too big, just really too big. And it's not a big data problem, it's really a quantum problem. And imagine that you could get tailored medicine for cancer patients by doing this, that we wouldn't kill them with the chemo, but maybe cure them with the right set of medication. Anyway, I think it's really cool. Yeah. Oh. Hello. Oh, hello. So um, the clear space communication between two parties, would that suffer from the same observing issues from Eve as the fiber communication? Yes. Yes, it would. So as a follow-up, then wouldn't it be possible to just continually deny communications between two parties yes. by doing that? So there's nothing robust about this. You could absolutely, like the availability component of this is a worry. So if you could get in between the satellite communication and the tank, you've got a problem. But I have seen some really like wild ideas being promoted in the military community about this stuff, about using solar-powered drones to carry communication. So you have like a sort of backhaul link. So you have a low Earth orbit satellite, then you have backhaul links over drones, and then you take the drone information and you put it to mobile units like tanks and other units. And don't forget, like th this is not science fiction because the Chinese actually, just Google this, just Google this. They actually are really proud about their low Earth orbit quantum computing satellites. They're really happy about it. Quantum key distribution not computing. Sorry, getting overly enthusiastic. We've yeah. got time for one more question, and you were pointing at somebody, but I have no idea who it was, so do you want to point at them again? Sorry? You were pointing at somebody? There was a person with their hand up. I don't know. You mentioned that the quantum computing will, will have a huge impact on, on public key cryptography. Well, what kind of impact will it have on symmetric crypt cryptography? If you can find a way to transfer your keys and rotate your keys effectively enough, and they're large enough, if you just take a CD full of keys and you have a really, really secure mechanism for getting them across the internet dynamically and safely, go for it. But usually now, when we have our symmetric key, the way that we get them across, we're still using, you know, you'd have to have a, a very strong, robust transfer mechanism. It's a transfer mechanism that usually fails. but it shouldn't have a direct impact. A long symmetric key, a one-time pad, where is the quantum effect? It's not there. It's really over our distributed, internet-grade, public key uh, algorithms. Asymmetric. Does that answer your question? Yep, thank you. I've got those books.